Hi everyone, thanks for your time, I really appreciate it. Um, so, I've been asked to talk to you today about linking employers with innovation and skills, so, so why am I well placed to do that? Well, my name's Chris Baker, I'm the Executive Director of Apprenticeships and Skills at Hull College. And I've been in education now for 12 years, I've been at Hull College for four years. Uh, and, and education is really, really close to my heart for a number of reasons. Um, I, I grew up in Hull, I actually grew up uh, in the inner city of Hull, uh, in one of the most deprived postcodes in the country. Um, and as I grew up, I very quickly realised that one of my only real platforms to move on and, and be successful in life was free education. So apprenticeships specifically, I, w I was a 16 year old apprentice uh, and I used apprenticeships uh, to get where I am today. So um, from an educational perspective, um, I'm going to give you some of the more fundamental reasons around how education can help your business and help employers and also training providers as well. But I also have a commercial background. So uh, for 10 years, for those of you that are, are local to the city, um, I worked for a large commercial business, a national business. Um, has anybody heard of, of Comet? It was a large electrical retailer. So I see some nods and smiles in the rooms. Um, I worked for Comet as an operational manager at the head office down George Street. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, what, what happened in 2012 was um, that company uh, saw its demise. This was a large company with six and a half thousand employees uh, and it went bust. Why did it go bust? Well, the fundamental reason why it went bust is because it, it simply failed to innovate. It, it failed to keep pace with its own sector and it died. Okay, so I've got the commercial background and I've got the educational background, so I'm hoping I can talk to you a little bit around how those two join up. This is the first fatal flaw that we make when we all sit in rooms and, and we talk about making improvements in our businesses. Uh, and we ask, why, why do we do that process? Well, well, we've always done it this way. Okay, so that's the first fatal flaw. How we need to address innovation is, is seeing change as an opportunity and not a threat to our business. And by having, having that mindset, it will truly help you innovate. The other mistake I often see when I sit in rooms with boring senior leaders um, and people trying to put together project plans is, is often people go, okay, so what do we innovate first? Or how do we innovate? When actually those are fundamentally wrong is the first question. The question needs to be, why do we innovate? What's our core value? What's our mission? What's our vision within our organization? And when we answer that question, then we know why we will innovate, not how or what. So as we know, innovation is currently happening at an unprecedented pace, uh, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years because people have started to buy experiences and not products. So people don't want to, don't want a DVD from you, they don't want a manual, they don't want a CD. For those of you that are old enough to know what a CD is. Um, they're buying an experience. Everybody can get a product to your door within 24 hours. Everybody can do that. So what sets you apart? It's the experience that sets you apart. We now have information at our fingertips. Our phones are our lives. We can access any type of information from around the world in an instant. And that is really changing the way in which people are learning. So people that had their heads buried in workbooks for three years doing degrees, that, that, that is dying, that method of learning, and it'll continue to fade. We've got digital fabrication. It's designed by computers, made by computers. And I'm gonna focus primarily today around automation. And I'm gonna talk about the digital revolution as well. But what we currently have is we currently have access to infinite computing. And what I mean by infinite computing is it's currently got limitless capability. So at the moment, what we do know is that our computing power is roughly doubling every two years, which means that phone that you've got in your hands right now is probably more powerful than all of the computing power that the whole world had five years ago. That's how powerful your phone is right now and it's only gathering pace. And what you'll find as well, if for those of you that run businesses, is that the cost of living, inflation, utilities are all going up, but actually the real-term cost of computing is coming down. It will almost reach zero in real terms by 2030. We're currently in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution and I won't take you through all of these but essentially um, we've passed the stage of assembly line mass production and we're now in a stage where we've got full automation where computers are designing computers 
and the designing engineering and mechanical processes without the need for human interaction. That can be a scary place for us, all, all of us that are over 40, but for youngsters, this is the norm. So what do we do at Hull College? So the main thing we have to do is we have to work with employers to make sure that our education is still fit for purpose. Are we teaching current and modern techniques or are we teaching traditional trades that are going stale? So the first thing we do is we speak to our employers and we ask our employers, where's your business going? And what's quite prevalent is when we ask them how much change do they foresee in their organization over the next one to five years? You can see that 90% of our employers are saying that they will feel some sort of change within their sector. That's really significant. And actually 40% of businesses said to us directly that they'll see significant change in their sector. So how do we keep up within our training programs? We know some of the key benefits around innovation. It makes you more competitive. It makes you foster loyalty and retention along your staff. Staff retention is a huge, a huge issue nationally at the moment. By improving your products, you'll attract more customers. You'll be able to run your business more efficiently. You'll be more agile and be able to change. And you'll build a resilience that Comet didn't do. So you'll be able to future-proof yourself and be able to react to changes and actually be proactive from an innovative perspective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about automation. What's the impact of, of automation on, on UK employment? And you can see here around employment, in the area of Hull, automation is going to negatively impact on employment by 7%, which is significant. If you think unemployment at the moment is around 5% nationally, you can see the significant impact of automation it's going to have on Hull. Why is it going to impact so heavily on Hull? We have a high manufacturing base. We have a lot of low level skilled labor as well. So unless we transform our businesses or the nature of our business in our area, we will feel automation in a negative way. So how does automation impact jobs? So we do know that on a positive, that it's going to invest almost $15 trillion into GDP by 2030. At the moment, we've only felt that change around 3%. So it's only put around 3% of our existing jobs at risk of automation currently. But that really does gather pace as we head into the 2030s. So 30% of all the jobs that are happening right now will not happen in 2030. And actually, for those of you that have got children, two thirds of the jobs that we are doing right now will not be available to our children. And that impacts us more, particularly um, from deprived areas where we tend to have lower education learners as well. So 44% of jobs that are happening now for low education, and what we mean by low education is for those learners that have a level two or below, they do not have a level three or above. 44% of those jobs are at risk. But what will our workforce look like in 2030? How will it help us make the shift? So for those of you that are old enough in the room, you are Gen X and by 2030, there'll only be 23% of you in the, in, the, in the employment sector. Gen Y, there will be 32% as well. And you'll see a real shift. So you will see a real shift into those generations that have used digital and used technology from birth. I have a 10 month old daughter and, and at the moment she already knows how to flick through my touch screen on my iPad and she's 10 months old. Um, it's part, it's ingrained in their life and their existence. And what this means is as, as, the, as the workforce shifts, people will be more available and more ready to adapt to digital transformation. And if you want to feel really old, 11% of your workforce in 2030 will be born after 2013. So what do we do? How do we address this as employers? How do we address this as training providers? In order to make sure that we have got the necessary skills, we're training, but also significantly we're retraining as well. We need a real focus on our low education levels. We need to uh, skill up or upskill, however you prefer to call it, much more vulnerable people are at risk of being displaced by machines. This is the really crucial one for me, is, is the collaboration between employers and providers. So training providers can often do what they think they know, but often employers are that real rich source of information. And by working together, you'll, you'll have a curriculum and an education that's fit for purpose. 
Employers and providers need to have a culture of adaptability and lifelong learning, so it's not just about learning when you're 16 to 19. On average, I saw a stat the other day, and, and I think the average person will have seven careers in their lifetime. No longer is there a lifelong career. So in education, in college speak, we will always look to, to prepare people for a life of work rather than prepare people for a career, because careers are changing all the time. We need to improve STEM skills for people because naturally those, those higher technological jobs are coming and they're coming fast. And we need to be flexible with our approach to learning as well. So people will not just want to learn a single subject because that's not going to set them up for their careers. They'll want to work across disciplines. They'll want to work short, sharp and fast. They don't want to sit in a classroom for three years and do a degree. They don't want to do uh, a two year um, full time program. That's simply not what our students are wanting to do. It's not fast paced enough. It's not reactive enough. And we need to be able to provide hybrid learning. Those companies that are most successful uh, are able to adapt to hybrid learning. That was very, very um, fast paced coming out of the pandemic. And it's the providers and the employers that have been able to adapt to hybrid learning that are actually thriving right now. There's one thing computers won't do, luckily for us, that by 2030, there'll be much more of a, a higher need for cognitive skills. Now I've avoided calling these soft skills because soft skills almost do it a disservice that, that it's less of a, a skill than the hard skills. The higher level cognitive skills and these are people, a human interaction that we need to be able to work at a higher level. We need to be able to solve complex problems. We need to act and think creatively and critically. We need to be aware of our surroundings around sustainability and green and what social value do we add to our employment. We need to be able to collaborate and communicate effectively across the world, globally, and we need to demonstrate high emotional intelligence as well. These skills will become absolutely critical to people's success as we move forward. The question we always get when we deal with employers, particularly our really small employers, employers that maybe have you know, less than 10 employees, is the barriers to transforming as well and setting themselves up for the future. And we often get asked the question, so how, how do we digitally transform? You give yourself a really clear strategy, it goes back to that why, not how and what, but why. Why are we changing? Why do we need to change? How is it going to benefit us? You need to take your people with you. If, you. if you're the one at the top of your organization and you want to innovate, you aren't going to innovate alone. You, you'll have to innovate with your people. You'll have to make sure that they've got the skills to be able to go along that journey with you. You need to be agile and be able to change quickly. You need to collaborate with other businesses, other organizations, other sectors, partnerships and training providers. You need to keep pace. And probably the number one thing, if any of you are involved in recruitment and selection in your business, you'll know that if you get this last thing right, you'll go a long way. So just final slide for me then, um, to avoid death by PowerPoint. Um, I just wanted to, to show you some of these. This is, this is taken from, from some LinkedIn research that I saw a couple of days ago. Uh, and it just really startled me, the types of jobs that we're going to be recruiting for in 2030. And when I look at my own apprenticeship programs that I run at Hull College, I think to myself, has, has our curriculum offer gone stale? Are we still meeting the needs of our employers? That's a genuine question that we need to ask ourselves all of the time. And these are some of the types of jobs uh, that we will be recruiting for in 2030. There'll be people that are 3D printing organs. There'll be people that are, are built to optimize drone usage. You might have your mortgage advisors now, but there'll be people advising you on digital currencies. Not just your standard authentic car mechanics, but there'll be some self-driving car mechanics. Population is set to rise to 9 billion by 2050 before petering off. We've got to put that garbage in trash somewhere and there'll be garbage designers that are designed because landfills are full where we have to find other ways to store our garbage. And also structural engineers that build in 3D. I was speaking to a construction company the other day and um, we had this conversation every year it feels like um, and he, they're dealing with a massive shortage in bricklayers for commercial housing, residential housing. We know that there's a national shortage. 
And we talked about the shortage of bricklayers and what we, can we do to solve the shortage. Well, actually, maybe the answer isn't how do we solve the shortage of bricklayers? Maybe the real question is, why don't we stop laying bricks? And that's what digital innovation looks like. It looks at a different way of doing things. We can 3D print buildings now. So we need to be giving people the skills to print buildings rather than lay bricks in the traditional sense. And I'll leave you with this. There's never been a greater time to innovate than right now. If you start now, you'll stay ahead of the curve and you'll protect your business for the future. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Great talk, thank you. Thank um, you. You really got me thinking, you talked about uh, the job losses happening in this region, particularly for manufacturing. For some reason, that hadn't clicked in my mind until you said it, though, just, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you doing currently at Health College to prepare for the metaverse? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, we've we've recently done a lot of work around digital transformation. Um, we, we've appointed um, a market leader, a director of digital transformation, who's already started to thrust us into the 22nd century. Um, I think as a college, as I alluded to in my presentation, is um, we're very much in the traditional space. Um, so we will die if we don't do more digital enhancement and digital enabling as well. Um, and that's part of our five-year strategy that we've just developed. We've got a, we've just developed a digital strategy as well around how we support that that change. Um, but there are training providers and colleges up and down the country that are, are probably ten years behind the curve compared to employers, and that's just being realistic. Um, and the only way we're going to get ahead of the curve and meet needs of employers is by getting ahead of you and not behind you. Um, uh, so we've we've got some work to do. I'll be honest. Yeah.